you're going to see we love to quote different business leaders and we quote different books in our books. And Warren Buffett just has this beautiful quote, business schools reward difficult, complex behavior more than simple behavior. But simple behavior is more effective. And we'll talk about that when we look at the Kinevin diagram or the Stacy matrix. And when we look at those two, keep this in mind because when you're talking about total chaos and you're going to be using completely novel practices to try to solve that versus uh, complex where you're probably going to be using emerging practices versus complicated where you're going to be using good practice versus simple where your best practice and this is where management consultants are eating the agile coaches lunches because the agile coaches don't get the even though it's right in front of their face they don't seem to understand that management consultants make their uh, money by simplifying things for organizations where uh, human nature is, is to make it overly complex, to over-engineer it. And that doesn't do any good for anybody. And that's why the whole practice of management consulting has emerged is because really sharp people recognize that, hey, there's patterns here and we can turn those patterns into best practices. The agilists believe they're the ones that came up with pattern recognition. Uh, sorry, guys, you didn't come up with it. It's been around for a long time. Uh, even in World War II, my dad was a code breaker. He was a cryptographer. He taught us that there are patterns in everything, uh, six degrees of separation, all of those cool things. And if you simplify things, you will be more effective, just like Warren Buffett says here. I'm going to share some stuff. I'm going to share some statistics with you. 70% of all change efforts fail. And that's straight from the Association of Change Management Professionals that was shared at one of their events in Stockholm when they were launching the chapter there about four or five years ago. 70% of all change effort fails. That means you only have a, a barely a one in three chance of succeeding. And when you think about it, there's a lot of reasons why change efforts fail. Now, Dr. Cotter, who writes for Harvard Business Review and is a former professor and has his consulting company, he points out that the vision for change is undercommunicated by a factor of 10. So, if you want to know why, any change effort fails or any project or any agile product development effort fails, I will guarantee you without exception that a good chunk of those failures are directly tied to either the inability or the neglect of an organization to communicate the need for the change, to communicate the vision for the change. If you're not communicating the vision, people are just going to go, huh? And that vision needs to answer, hey, dude, what's in it for me? And if we're not answering that question at the individual level, we're going to see most of our efforts go up in smoke. That represents a lot of money in companies to have you're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars per project and you have them fail. Wow, that's amazing. Here's another picture that I love sharing. In Sweden, KPMG and PMI chapter of Sweden have done a survey now for, I think, like the last four or five years. And they've been measuring the success of traditional project management. And their definition was that you achieve 80% of the scope in addition to being on time and in, on budget. And those three triple constraints together uh, constitute, constitutes their definition for success. 
using that as their yardstick. And, and that's only achieving 80% of the scope. That's not even delivering what the customer asked for, but 80% of what the customer asked for. You're talking about uh, the when they actually got the surveys correct, the first year they got 14% success rate. 86% of projects failed. That's like one in seven. I mean, come on guys, really? Only one in seven projects succeed? Okay, and so it went 14, 15, 16%, and then it leveled out at 16% in the fourth year. So it's like from... Uh, 2015 to 2019, when, whenever they were doing those surveys, and I think they do those every year. So another one will be coming out this year in uh, February, March, April, whenever it comes out. That's going to be interesting, because at the current rate of improvement, the traditionalists will take another 26 years to catch up with the guys and gals that are doing Agile and Scrum. Where, according to the surveys, are they achieving a 42% success rate? So almost three times better the success rate using Agile and Scrum. That alone should be the entire business case of why you should never use anything remotely resembling traditional ever again. Okay, I'm not saying you can't use traditional, but if I was using traditional, I would be inserting every tool and weapon that I have from Agile into the traditional in order to try to get that traditional project up to the Agile and Scrum level of results. Now, the change management professionals, they're doing about double better. And then the Agile and Scrum is at 42%. I'm going to drop in another slide here along the way. And it's going to be an example of what we've observed of when you put flow on top of these three, what happens? How much more success do we actually achieve? Those of you that have seen some of the other presentations I've done, you've seen this slide, but I wanted to include it here again just for uh, reinforcement and repetition. And this is a slightly updated version of uh, those pictures. And basically, um, traditional and agile, whether you're at 15, 16% for traditional and around 42% for agile, as your starting point. When you use flow with traditional, because flow sits above, traditional flow sits above agile, flow is a leadership framework. When you set flow above and over these like an umbrella, suddenly everything starts to work as, as it was more intended to work. And so We've noticed that when you use flow with traditional projects and look for all the areas where you can apply lean thinking and theories of constraints and all of those things that have been taught for decades, when you actually apply it to the project program portfolio, suddenly you go from languishing at one in seven projects being really, really good to closer to delivering maybe four out of every 10. And these numbers are for demonstration purposes. We haven't done a study saying, yes, it, it is exactly 38%. It's there for demonstration purposes. And we know that we get near agile results for traditional projects when we use flow with them. Now, the other thing that we've observed is that when you take flow and you put it above agile and use it as the leadership framework it's intended to be and plugs the gaps that exist in agile as well as in traditional when you do that all of a sudden your percentages increase dramatically as far as how well you succeed the value add that you're delivering to the company either through increased revenue and sales or cost savings or cost avoidance or even 
risk getting rid of it or mitigating the risk and just for doing the right thing. When you do that, you're going to get higher percentages and it's going to depend, of course, on your people. But if you've got good people, you're going to be able to deliver some remarkable results using flow and putting flow on top of it because it just turbocharges it. It's just, it's amazing. And it's repeatable. It isn't just Ted or me. Other people are using flow and getting similar or better results. If you look at the videos in Why Use Flow, the interviews with Jeff and Jay, for example, they're just a couple of the flow certified professionals that are out there are flow certified trainers that have taken flow, applied it in their daily work, and achieved truly remarkable results. So it's not a question anymore of whether or not this works or even why should you use it. It's it works and we know for certain if you apply this and you apply it correctly and consistently, you have a really good chance of achieving really good results or even remarkable results. And that sort of dove and that sort of dovetails into our next slide where when you look at the number of people who are in an organization, this was a Gallup from 2018, and they did a, a global survey of employee engagement, and it was only 13% of the employees are engaged. I shouldn't be laughing because that's really sad. 87% of your employees are either disengaged, and I think the percentage that were actively, aggressively disengaged, that means that they're working against you, was somewhere up around 20%. And this is a brutal fact that the companies need to address. Now, I worked with a company here recently in the last few years where they had been doing the employee surveys and they had been doing Agile for six, seven years at that point in time, maybe eight years or even nine, whatever. They <clears throat> were measuring their employee engagement and they were getting numbers up around 17, 18%. So they were actually about 50% above the global average. And that's an organization that was doing Agile. And uh, but they were at the point where the Agile transformation had lost steam and they were seeing their numbers uh, going down as far as employee, employee engagement and satisfaction. And so they wanted to step in and do an Agile reboot, get things going again, try to breathe some life back into the teams and... <clears throat> And so that's what we came in to do, and we worked with them for about a half a year to get them back on track and headed the right direction. And when you look at this uh, employee satisfaction survey, I realized that it to me it felt like it's like, this works for married couples, by the way, as well. It's like your expectations versus reality, how well those align and match determine are the people engaged, are they disengaged, or are they actively disengaged where they're working against you. And so it almost becomes a formula where expectations minus reality equals your level of engagement or disengagement. I'm pretty certain, I haven't refined this, but I'm pretty certain that uh, this is a formula that could work, and I'm pretty certain that there's a way that we can measure this, um, but it would have to be a somewhat complex algorithm to be able to pull that off, even though this looks very simple, because everybody's expectations versus their reality, that's so individual. How do you measure that? But I think even for married couple, couples, they come into marriage, I've been married for 35 years, so I guess I might have a slight idea of what I'm talking about. 
you know, everybody comes in the marriage uh, wearing rose-colored glasses. You have super high expectations. Then reality hits. <laughs> and this happens for every couple. And the further you slip down from a 100% match, the, uh, does your expectations and your reality match, the further you slide down that scale, the more disengaged or active disengaged, actively disengaged the couple becomes. And I'm not a therapist, but I think that this is probably a pretty good um, indication or a pretty good way to look at even relationships between a married couple. And if, if your expectations are down in that lower left corner, uh, you could probably use it as a predictor about how long it will be before that couple gets divorced. So that's uh, something to think about. It's a little segue from what we're actually talking about with employees, but the principles are the same. And if your expectations and your reality are not aligning, then you will disengage. You'll, you could even actively disengage. Um, and when, when an employee gets to that level and they're actively working against you and actively working against the vision of the company, uh, that's when all kinds of politics are going to erupt and you're going to just have all kinds of difficulties uh, keeping everything going the right direction.